I'm really excited to be here, and I want to thank uh, Andy and Elena for organizing this. I think this is the first that I'm aware of, first HDF workshop to take place in Europe that, that we participated in. I hope it's the beginning of a, of a long, uh, a long series of ones. And I want to thank all of you for for coming here. Uh, I'm really excited to, to hear from you. Um, so I'm going to start off with some of the easy stuff just to tell tell people a little bit about um, where we came from, what the HDF group uh, is all about, uh, and maybe a little bit about uh, future things that we're going to be doing uh, to sort of, so let's see, uh, I forgot how to. Advance no, 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 no. focus. Okay. So we just have to I guess I have, just have to hit that guy. Uh, yeah. Put one seat back in there. There you are. Okay, oh. so now I think spacebar should work. Spacebar should work now. Okay. Uh, so who we are, where we came from, uh, a little bit about our mission and, and future directions, uh, really to foreshadow what Elena and John will be talking about um, later. So who we are, where we came from. Uh, Back in 1987, uh, the National, Super National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, was getting started uh, at the University of Illinois. <clears throat> and they were there to provide supercomputing facilities for the academic uh, community uh, to run uh, big simulations, or were considered big sim simulations at that time there. Visualization was a big part of what they did. And there was a, a group that did desktop visualization. And among that group, there was a, uh, a, a, a committee that called themselves the Graphics Foundation's Task Force. Uh, and this is a, an email describing a meeting uh, in October of 1987 in which they were looking for <clears throat> some way of managing the data between all of these different systems, the big systems, the small systems, the desktops, the supercomputers. Um, some of the uh, needs were that it had to be extendable, it had to be fast, uh, it had to have options like compression, uh, it should support gridded data storage. <clears throat> they eventually, uh, they initially called it uh, the all-encompassing hierarchical object-oriented format, or IHU, um, <clears throat> and these are some of the criteria that they, they came up with in that meeting. Uh, it should be possible to store data in a method that hasn't been possible with other formats, should encompass every conceivable future type of data, uh, modest uh, desire there. And if it worked well, they hoped that other people would adopt it. Uh, <clears throat> they wanted it to be machine independent. Um, and anything that was any other, in any other data format, they wanted to be able to accommodate that in this new format that they were developing. <clears throat> Uh, after a little bit, they changed the name from IHU to HDF, the Hierarchical Data Format. The first release was in April of uh, 1988, uh, and it became uh, immediately popular because the visualization tools, which were also free and open source, as was HDF, uh, were used widely. Uh, our biggest breakthrough in the early 90s came when NASA was developing the Earth, assist, Earth Observing System to study global climate change. Uh, and they decided to adopt HDF as the format to handle all the satellite data that they would be collecting. Uh, that was really important to us because it provided our group with some funding, uh, long-term funding. It also uh, provided us with a requirement that our software uh, meet uh, mission critical technology standards. Uh, so that was really good, and we, and we had the funding to try to do that. <clears throat> but that was very helpful. Uh, almost as interesting to me was our first sort of, as far as I knew, major European adoption of HTF, a project called Trappist. I don't know if any people here ever heard of that, but uh, the uh, French Electricity Board, I think, was the, maybe at least one of the leaders in that project. Um, this was a, a, a bunch of different organizations, aerospace, shipbuilding, medicine, uh, uh, nuclear power plants that were using tomography to do testing materials uh, for, for, uh, for quality and, and other 
uh, other reasons, and they needed a way to store the massive amounts of data that they were collecting. They were building tools that they were sharing across the industry, um, and they needed a binary format. They already had a text-based format called STEP, uh, and they adopted HDF. So that was really interesting to me and our first sort of really big European connection. By the middle of the 90s, however, uh, we began to realize that HDF had some limitations. <clears throat> you couldn't have a file that was bigger than two gigabytes. Uh, the number of objects was limited to about 20,000 in an HDF file. Uh, the data models were, were rather rigid. We had designed it so that if you ever needed a new data model, you had to recode that. You could still accommodate it, but, but it meant more code, which meant that the code got more and more complex. Um, and I.O. performance was fine for the 80s, but it really didn't anticipate the massive amounts of, of parallel systems that we would be seeing in the parallel I.O. that we need to do. So that was a challenge for us. Uh, uh, in, in the early 90s, there was a nuclear test ban treaty, uh, which resulted in the Department of Energy labs not no longer being able to blow things up to test nuclear weapons, and they were going to have to do the testing in software. Uh, they they uh, initiated something called the Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative. Uh, they were anticipating the need for systems that would be a couple of orders of magnitude greater than any that existed at the time, which meant huge amounts more of data uh, and having to be able to deal with the data. And they came to us and they said, you know, would HDF maybe be appropriate for our data management needs uh, for this project? And because of what I just said on the previous slide, we had to say, no, we're sorry, it's not going to be able to scale in that way. But we have some ideas for maybe a better, a newer version of HDF. Um, I like this slide that came from one of the workshops we had uh, in developing this next generation of HDF because it shows the, the complexity of the various kinds of data that, that have to be accommodated in this kind of system and the metadata and, and so forth. So eventually we developed something that we called Big HDF. Uh, at first, uh, then uh, we decided that since the other version of HDF had reached HDF4, was its, uh, was its uh, final version, we would call this HDF5. Uh, and we'd have no plans for an HDF6. This was you know, going to be HDF5. It's sort of like Windows 10, right? The idea is, okay, this is it, and then we're just going to kind of uh, improve it, and hopefully We've designed it in such a way that it can grow and scale uh, without having to come up with a new format. <clears throat> Another thing that was happening during that time was that we were encountering uh, more and more groups like NASA, like uh, uh, people doing flight testing and so forth, that were collecting data and they were planning to keep that data for the long term. Uh, so, for example, if you run a flight test, you have to keep the results of that flight test for the life of the aircraft, which could be 40 or 50 years. NASA wanted to keep their data around for generations, if not hundreds of years. Uh, <clears throat> and the assumption was, well, HDF comes from the University of Illinois, which is a law, which is an institution that will be around for a long term so time, so HDF will be around for a long time. Uh, well, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the university doesn't do software, right? They do research and they do teaching, uh, and they really had no interest in preserving what we were doing. So we were looking for a way uh, within, the, within the university environment to um, meet the needs for uh, long-term support of this technology that, that we were developing. <clears throat> we needed to, uh, we, we were concerned about the durability of open source projects. Now, obviously, many open source projects uh, are great. They last for a long time. But many more open source projects don't make it. Okay, and We were concerned about that because we had to make it. People were putting their stuff in HDF, assuming it better would be around for a long time. So we thought we needed some sort of institutional support. <clears throat> uh, we had uh, people using HDF in rather complex ways, and so we thought that that support that institutional support should be strong on the user support side. So it should be 
uh, somehow able to fund a strong user support component. Because of the complex formatting, of course, we uh, underneath HDF5, uh, we needed, of course, the API, the library, the utilities, and the documentation, and we needed to be able to develop those and, and, and evolve those. And because of the need for long-term storage, the software had to be designed and it had to be uh, supported for the, for the long term. So uh, it wasn't uh, possible, we found. We tried for really for a couple of years to find a way to become a long-term institution within the University of Illinois. We decided eventually that we needed to spin off and create a company. Um, we looked at various business model options. Should we be for-profit or a not-profit company? Uh, how are we going to make money, whatever we are? Uh, what do we do about intellectual property? The university owned all the intellectual property at that point. Uh, we decided we should be not for profit because we wanted to be mission driven, uh, that we would at least initially make money uh, from the contracts that we already had with the government and try to continue those and, and get others and, and um, get support from uh, National Science Foundation, other institutions to develop and, and maintain this format. As far as IP goes, uh, we made it. A, we went to the university and said, you know, you should give us the IP, uh, and we gave them a little bit of a royalty off of any commercial contracts that we had. Uh, we had that for about uh, about uh, ten or fifteen years, I think, and then eventually we convinced them to to drop that, and so now we we own it without having to pay anything for it. Um, so, so now we're the HDF group. Uh, we spun off in 2006. We had about 12 employees at the time. We're now up to around 40 employees. Our uh, headquarters are in Champaign, Illinois, but we have staff members like John is in uh, Seattle, Washington, in uh, a number of other states in, in the US. Uh, HDF5 is obviously our platform, our flagship uh, platform. Uh, there are tens of thousands of users uh, every day of HDF and, and probably several million uh, overall people who use HDF. Uh, there are over 1,500 projects on uh, GitHub that, that use HDF. Um, we work with industry. We work with research institutions. Uh, we work with government. Most of our funding comes from government, uh, but all of these sources uh, provide funding that helps us improve HDF, builds, we work with them to build solutions, we provide support, and that's really kind of what our business model is at, is at this time. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about our mission and commitment. From the very beginning, we've been committed to providing open source software uh, and to serving the community of HDF users. Um, our website is perhaps the most important source of communication um, <clears throat> about um, HDF. Uh, we have about 15, between 15 and 25,000 visitors per month to our website. Um, most of those visitors come to download software. Uh, the HDF library download page uh, this year has seen an average of about 9,000 visitors per month. Uh, actually, HDF View, the HDF View download page, uh, has seen about 10, uh, a little over 10,000 uh, visitors per month. So <clears throat> that's what most people do when they come to our website. But we also have a support portal there. We try to provide support through a number of different channels. Uh, for developers, probably the, the, the most important channel is the HDF forum. Uh, that plus the documentation, I'd say, are probably the most important sources of information. And so anyone in this room is probably a you know, candidate for um, signing up for the HDF forums. Good way to ask questions, get answers, and help, help others uh, with answers. Uh, we have a, a blog series that covers HDF5, covers applications, how to use HDF5 effectively. Um, also, by looking at who reads, uh, at, at what blogs people read, it helps us know what people are interested in. Uh, you might be interested to know that our most, uh, most popular uh, two blogs over years, and continues to be the case, 
our, our blogs that Elena wrote on data compression. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, that's kind of interesting. Uh, so we have about between three and 4,000 uh, readers per month of, of the HDF blog. We also have uh, tried to do a webinar series. We don't do as many as we'd like to, but we want to ramp that up and do more as time goes on. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and recently, again, under Elena's leadership, we formed a techni technology advisory board, uh, which advises uh, us on the HDF5 uh, roadmap. Uh, and they also try to help uh, help us focus on how to build uh, the HDF5 developers community, and make it stronger. <clears throat> so I, include, I encourage especially the people in this room to, to get engaged, uh, present a webinar about your project. Uh, HDFQL is going to have a webinar later this year. Um, write a blog about your project or some aspect of HDF5 that you found, you know, a solution to that works well or, or whatever. Uh, share your information. Uh, Lori Cooper, whose email is there, laurie.cooper at hdf.org, uh, is very good at helping people uh, <clears throat> organize and write their blogs. So if you're not a writer, you, you can get a lot of help from her on that. Um, so please, yes, do get engaged. Uh, I want to finish by talking a little bit about uh, what we've been doing with HDF5 since it started and then some future directions of, of um, the HDF group and some of the R&D areas that we're working in. When, and this really is going to be just very high level, uh, but I think we'll hear a lot more about these things from the participants in this workshop. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. First 10 years of, of HDF5 really are what we might characterize as a maturation period. We matured the HDF5 data model. Uh, we, we especially focused on parallel I.O. because that was really what was important in the DOE labs uh, <clears throat> that were funding most of our work during those, during those early years. There were community standards based on the original HDF, like Nexus, and uh, HDF EOS, the Earth Observing System version of HDF. Um, and they moved from HDF4 to HDF5. Uh, of course, we still helped them with the legacy data that was in HDF4 as well as the HDF5. And then many other standards emerged in a variety of different uh, industries and, and disciplines, you know, like in biotech, for example, and astronomy and others uh, started happening with, with HDF. Um, in the next, uh, in the in the time, I guess, what's that? 13, uh, 15 years uh, following, uh, no, it's 11 years following that. Um, <clears throat> we really saw the expansion of HDF into non-high performance computing uh, communities, um, as well as into the exascale, the H HPC world that was moving to to exascale. It we saw it use across almost every imaginable domain, uh, particularly any domain that deals with, with large data, oil and gas. Uh, a lot of our funding during the first eight years of our existence came from the finance community. There was one hedge fund that used HGF that, that gave us over a million dollars a year. Uh, and that was really helpful for us because we got a huge profit from them and that helped us support our, our community work and our sustaining engineering and other stuff like that. Uh, astronomy was another area where HDF use grew very good, rapidly. Uh, biotech was another one. <clears throat> we also uh, focused on improving I.O. performance, particularly continuing with uh, parallel I.O. tuning and parallel I.O. performance. Metadata I.O turned out to be an area that we had to really focus a lot on because it tended to be a bottleneck because of all the little rights that are involved when you're doing metadata I.O. Uh, <clears throat> the software ecosystem just exploded during that time and it's, it's continuing to explode. And I think a lot of what we'll hear from people at this workshop uh, reflects that uh, explosion, explosion. Probably the biggest single at least from our perspective, the biggest single development in that area was H5Pi. Uh, it just opened HDF to a huge and, again, another fast-growing uh, community. But Pandas, 
uh, R interfaces to HDF5, Julia, many others. Um, as I mentioned, there are 1,500 plus projects in GitHub that use HDF5. There are over 400 uh, Python related projects that use HDF5. And this is all the community. This is not us. This is the community doing this stuff. Um, <clears throat> we also added, we're able to add new features that reflected needs of different disciplines like particle accelerators. We got that's very good funding and help from that community that helped us expand HDF5 in new ways. As I mentioned, finance funded a lot of new developments with HDF5, uh, observational data, and, and others. Um, so as, uh, as far as uh, future directions go, we uh, plan to support, uh, as we have in the past, our legacy uh, HDF uh, uh, library codes as much as we possibly can. Uh, operating systems and languages change and we hope to uh, plan to, we will adapt to those as those changes occur. We will continue to improve the library, the tools, the documentation, um, and especially, and Elaine will speak to this as well, we want to emphasize increasing our involvement with the community that it's done so much for us, but we want to help that community as well uh, and, and um, help them steer us and, and steer them. We want to leverage new memory computing and storage, storage architectures. This is what we have done. We will continue to that. Uh, deep memory hierarchies. Uh, we want to take advantage of the new extreme scale IO architectures that are occurring. Uh, storage architectures like open IO. We want to really work with them. And we've, uh, I've got five minutes. Okay, I think I can make it. <laughs> um, uh, we have, uh, Elena will talk about our virtual object layer, uh, which, is a, which is an implementation that allows uh, people using the HDF5 API to, act, to access uh, uh, data that's stored differently from the standard kind of HDF5 format. For example, with ZAR, uh, we want to, uh, we, we have a, a tool called Swimmer the single writer, multiple reader tool. Um, we found a lot of interest in that. People want to be able to read their data as it's being written to an HDF file, and that's another area where we're going to focus. Um, <clears throat> Non-traditional uses of HDF5, like MapReduce architectures, Hadoop, HDFS, that's another area that we've begun to focus on and plan to focus on a lot more. Deep learning, uh, Relational database management systems, RDBMS, you know, basic tabular data uh, systems is another area that we're, that we're working on and hope to continue on. Uh, John will talk a lot about our work uh, on uh, what we initially thought of as adapting HDF5 to the cloud, but really we're, we're, we're talking about any sort of environment where we're combining uh, data and computing services. Um, <clears throat> The idea is that uh, you want to be able to uh, access data services as conveniently as though that data was uh, on your desktop, but be able to access large repositories without having to move those repositories to your to your desktop, to, sh to repositories where communities can share data, uh, bringing uh, computing to the data. You all are, are familiar with this paradigm, and it's something that we want to become more and more involved in. Another thing is we're finding more and more interest in large-scale querying, where you're querying very large repositories, uh, or you have you know, like a 400 terabyte HDF5 file and you want to query data within that file, supporting that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and finally, again, getting back to this community focus, uh, one of the things that communi the community has done so much better than we have done, uh, we can learn from that, ease of use, productivity with using HDF5, our C++ API that's been introduced in the last couple of years comes from the community. Uh, we want to work with uh, tool developers. H H5Pi, again, is a, is a good example of that. So hopefully that gives you a sense of where we came from, what we are, and where we're going. And with that, I'll wrap up and turn it over to Elena, Andy. So, okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>